Hello all, Don Schmidt, the Book Kahuna, coming at you today with Pub Talk. Today's Pub Talk, I have a very special guest, and my guest today is John Higgs, the author of Dealing with Danger, Be Prepared, Aware, and Decisive. Now, a little um, primer on John and I, we are both in the same Toastmasters group here in uh, Louisville, Colorado, uh, Speak With Ease, and that's how John and I actually met and got to know each other, and during the course of our conversations, uh, John mentioned that he was working on, uh, or had already done a book, and uh, I asked him to come on and give us some information on Pub Talk, and he agreed. So... Or I guess first thing I'll do is uh, let John tell you a little bit about himself and how he got to the point where he decided to write this book. So, John, welcome to Pub Talk. Hi, Don. Thanks for having me on the show. Uh, how did I get to the point where I wrote a book? Well, first of all, I, uh, I grew up in London and uh, didn't come to the United States until I was an adult. And there was one incident that happened in London uh, back in 1981, I think it was, that uh, was a little bit of a, a life changer for me. My, my wife and I, we were living in the East End of London, which some of your listeners may know is uh, it's an old and not necessarily one of the best parts of town. It's where Jack the Ripper used to uh, live, basically. And one day there was a riot in our street, and when I mean a riot, I mean somewhere between two and three hundred youths at one end of the street, and about one hundred police officers at the other end of the street. And they decided to charge each other, and they wound up right in front of our house. And the the riot was over fairly quickly, and we didn't sustain any physical effects from it, but it kind of got me thinking a little bit about whether you have to go through life basically just bumping into bad situations and hoping you get through them or whether there's some way that you can plan for some of this stuff and prepare for some of the things that uh, a lot of us ultimately will face and um, even though I didn't start writing the book until about four years ago I spent a lot of my time in between the day of that riot and today just trying to put together some simple kind of methodology if you will that just would help almost anyone either avoid or deal with some of the standard kind of usual bad situations that happen to so many people and in writing this book who did you think would be the main beneficiaries of the information that you were, uh, you know, the content that you were putting out? I, I really wanted it to be a, a book about general principles that just about anyone could read the book and pick and choose some of the, the tools and the ideas that, that are in there that they could use for their own specific situation. So in, in a lot of ways I made it general enough and generic enough that almost anybody can find some items in there that they can use immediately. I kept it deliberately very simple, talked in broad principles and used some fairly, fairly broad examples to illustrate those principles. Now while you were writing the book were, were there any um, eye-opening pieces of content that you came up with that uh, just it was an aha moment where you said wow you know that's that's something that uh, I never thought about before yeah definitely there were a lot of things one good thing about writing the book is that I, I had a lot of this information in my head or easily available at the time I was going through writing it and you've probably come across this before that when you actually sit down and start putting your ideas on paper it actually solidifies those ideas more in your mind and instead of having this jumbled thought process in your head you can condense it down to a half page or a page or whatever it is of solid 
structured information that's easy for someone else to come along and read and digest and actually apply. And that was one of the big things for me about writing the book, that it helped to solidify a lot of these ideas and principles that I put in there. There was, in some of the chapters, um, a lot of where you were, uh, and I love the halftones, by the way, where you were the actual perpetrator. Uh, that, that was, that was a, <laughs> the great part of the book. But in a lot of the chapters, you dealt with how um, women would be put in situations where they would be forced to deal with certain events and how they should react and, and come away. And, and can you give us a little insight into some of those different aspects that you had written about? Yeah, I did. Um, the, the book isn't specifically targeted at men or women or any one of particular age or anything like that. But one thing that I realized as I was going through uh, writing it and also doing some of the additional research for it is that we all know there's a big difference between men and women. And one of the very general character traits that women have, I think, is that they have a tendency to look at something that might be a potentially bad situation and say something to themselves like, oh, it'll be okay, or, oh, I'm just being silly. You know, there's really no problem here. I'm just, I'm just being a little silly about it. And uh, I think that that's one of the things that I've seen before in some of the the teaching I've done before with uh, some of the firearms training that I've that I've given to people in the past, that we often, regardless of gender or age or anything else, we often tend to dismiss the things that are right in front of us. You're walking down the street and you see a guy who's been following you for the last three blocks and you're getting that feeling, the hair's standing up on the back of your neck and you're thinking, I know he isn't just walking in the same direction as me, this guy's actually following me. And then the next thought is, no, nah, I'm just being silly, it'll be okay. And it's that point when you dismiss something that your sixth sense or your experience, for want of a better term, is telling you is something you should pay attention to. And instead you go, ah, no, I'm just, I'm just having a bad day. It's really nothing. Maybe it is nothing or maybe it is something. But you need to go through that evaluation process and say, wait a minute, what am I really looking at here and what are the potential outcomes from this? You know, John, it's very interesting that you that you brought that up because uh, when I was working in Manhattan, I actually had an experience like that where I left work late um, and I, I worked around Union Square and had to walk up to Penn Station and, and I used to zigzag through blocks up and at a certain point I noticed that I had a tail and I got to... A, I, I, he said, nah, just as you said, you're, you're kind of trying to put it, you know, get it out of your mind that this isn't really happening. It's not what, what it appears to be. But, but meanwhile, you're thinking, well, maybe it is. You don't know. And in, in my, what I did at that point was I got to one of the avenues, and as the light just was about to turn green, I sprinted across to see if this person was going to follow me across. And you know what ended up happening? Um, he did, and he started laughing. And I heard him say, don't try that again or you're dead. Okay? And, but I, I, and he was still about 50 yards behind me. And I got to a point where I said, okay, time to get a cab. Time to get a cab and just get out of this situation. And I hailed a cab. Cab didn't come right away. So he got really close. Cab came, I got in the cab, and then he went into a stance like he was going to fire. He like pulled something out of his back pocket and went up like he was going to fire into the cab right at me, and it was his wallet. He was, hmm. just, he was just messing with me. So, But you never know. That's right, you don't. And the thing about it was, though, John, I, I, seriously, I didn't even duck. Because I wanted to see if he really had a gun. Okay, as stupid as that sounds. I was looking at him 
as he went into the stance and everything and pulled it out because I wanted to see, does he really have a piece? You know? Well, you were, Don, you were in the middle of a, of a very steep learning curve at that point because if you had been somebody, say, who had been a, a, a veteran police officer or a member of the military or someone like that who's been conditioned to dealing with those kinds of situations, then they would have already had a plan. They'd have already gone into some uh, pre-practiced and trained for routine, whether it was diving to the floor of the cab, right. pulling, their own, pulling their own pistol, whatever it was, but this was a situation that was basically completely new to you and you were, it was on the job training for you, you were learning as you were living it. Exactly. And I think that's one of the things we need to try and avoid having happen to us, which is why I say in the book, think about some of the situations that may occur in your life. Play that what if game. You know, what if that was to happen? What if that guy was to start following me? and then you're already a little bit ahead of the curve. You're starting to think about things that you can do to respond to whatever that person's action is going to be rather than just having it suddenly blow up in your face and you're standing there going, what am I going to do? And I'll give you an example other than a street crime kind of situation. But let's say, for example, that you live out in the middle of nowhere somewhere. You just bought a nice house next to a a river, you've got a little piece of land there, and one day, as we've seen in Colorado fairly recently, uh, it starts raining, and it rains, and it rains, and it rains, and it rains, and suddenly there's a sheriff's deputy standing at your door saying, the river is about to burst its banks, you have five minutes to grab your gear and get out because we're clearing the area. And we've seen those kinds of events happen in Colorado. Yes. Do you think it would be better if you had a plan in place where you played that what-if game way before it started raining and you said, okay, I live in a floodplain. It's a, it's a hundred-year floodplain. The, the, the chances of me getting flooded out are fairly small, but I'm still going to have a basic plan for it. I'm going to figure out where I'm going to go, what I'm going to take with me, who I'm going to take with me, how we're going to get to whatever safe area we've chosen as our destination, and what is the event that is going to trigger our decision to actually leave. And if you can answer those five questions ahead of time, you're way ahead of the curve. And then the deciding factor is, okay, what, what is it that would cause me to evacuate my home. Well, let's say, for example, that river generally runs at 10 to 15 feet deep. Okay. And you say to yourself, okay, uh, when the river reaches 14 feet deep and is within a foot of flooding its banks, that is the point when I will leave. The worst case is it never actually floods and you've moved all your stuff out of town for a couple of days to no real effect, but it's a lot better than waiting until there's water coming under the front door and then you're saying, what do I do now? Right. So a lot of this is just all about having simple plans for specific situations and knowing when to actually execute those plans. What is the trigger that decides when you will put your plan into effect? And that, with the, the flood stage, uh, scenario is a, is a very good one, but even more common would be a fire and, and sure. how to get out of your house. And, and you know, you, you, your book got me really thinking, John, because I have a two-story house and the master bedroom is in the top floor, and my only ways out are pretty much jump out the window like 30 feet to the concrete below or try and get down the stairs and get out through a possible area that's blocked by the fire. So... You know, it's de definitely got me thinking about different ways to get out of my house if something adverse were to happen, like my house is on fire. Mm -hmm. So, uh, all things to think about. And um, the the one thing I wanted to ask you though is the, the the allegory of the of the junkyard dog. How how did you 
put that together? How, where does that all fit into the whole um, dealing with danger scenario? I, I'm glad you asked me that because that took me a little while to really piece together in, in the way that I that I wanted to present it, and I used the the, the analogy of a junkyard dog because think about an actual physical junkyard. It's a place. It, it's a business that someone owns. They buy old cars and old refrigerators and sell old cars and bits of cars and everything. That they're, they're buying and selling stuff the whole time. So that that junkyard, that business that they own, has value in in the same way that our lives have value, if you like. So, because it's a place of value, they put a fence around it. And at night, when the junkyard dog, uh, excuse me, the junkyard owner goes home, he locks the gate and he puts this smart, capable, observant dog in the junkyard to guard his business overnight until he comes back the following morning. Now, the, this junkyard dog, he really only lives by three rules he's vigilant his radar is running, he's paying attention to what's going on around him. He will deal, rule number two, he will deal with any problem inside of that fence that encompasses the junkyard business. And the third one is that if he does deal with a problem, he won't pursue that problem over the fence and down the street. He doesn't care what happens outside of that fence. He only cares about what happens inside of that junkyard fence. And we can take that basic principle and apply it to our own lives and say, what is it that I'm responsible for and what is the boundary that encompasses my area of responsibility? So let, let me give you another example to kind of solidify that a little bit. Um, let's say that you have uh, you have the, the mother of a, a young child, a toddler, and uh, she takes that child out to a park somewhere. There is um, uh, th this idea of the junkyard fence, this boundary. It's not a static, solid boundary. It's like a big rubber band, and it it can it can move around. It's it, think of your personal space. When you step into an elevator, if you're the only person in an elevator, you pretty much stand in the middle of that elevator and your personal space is the whole elevator. And then uh, some, the doors open and someone else gets in. What happens? We, all, we move to one side of the elevator and they go and stand in the other side of the elevator and now you've got two people with a personal space that is half the size of that elevator. And a third person gets in, and now you've got three people, and we all kind of stand equidistant from each other, and we all have that personal space. Okay, right. so you go back to the example of the of this this uh, this mother with a toddler running around in the park. Her personal space is like this big rubber band. It goes around her. It goes around that child, and wherever that child runs, she's watching that child. She's paying attention to what that child is doing, and that area of personal space expands and contracts. Now, say somebody's dog gets off the leash and gets in between her and the child. That's a potential bad situation. It's a potential threat. So there's her trigger right there to say, I need to take control of this situation. I need to go and get my child or make get in between the dog and my child or whatever it happens to be to secure that situation. So, going back to the junkyard dog analogy, we're basically creating a, some kind of a boundary around a specific situation. And if that boundary is crossed, that's our trigger to take some kind of pre-planned action. Just the same way we go back to the idea that, hey, if the river reaches 15 feet deep, it's a foot away from breaking its banks, it's time for me to take action and leave or whatever we decide to do. Excellent. Ex okay, excellent point. Now, talk a little bit about... I I've heard recently that there are more and more um, uh, break-ins where people are actually uh, taken hostage in their houses while they're, they're 
in, involved in the robbery or whatever's happening. So how would you set up a, a safe room within your house and, and, and what would be the parameters of how you would do that? Um, well, first of all, Don, let, let's sort of define what a safe room is. A, a, a safe room is basically uh, a safe haven within your house where you can go and hide in the event that there's a home invasion or a burglary or some guest or friend is starting to get a little bit out of control and, and you need somewhere to hole up that's safe until help can arrive. That's the basic idea of a safe room. So having said that, there's a whole range of safe rooms out there that, that you can put into a house. There are companies that will build a safe room in your house that is basically a large concrete reinforced steel box with a big strong door and a lock on it. That's thousands and thousands of dollars worth of equipment to secure your safe room. If you ever saw the Jodie Foster movie, uh, Panic Room, I think it was yes. called. Yes, a few I, was, I was just thinking of that. It, it's a similar kind of thing. Um, uh, there's, a, there's definitely a time and a place for safe rooms. For example, if your house was on fire, I wouldn't recommend going and hiding in the safe room. I mean, you need to get away rather than hunker down and, and hide in the safe room. The safe room is a little bit like the Alamo, when you think about it. At the Alamo, a bunch of Texans went into the, that, uh, that old church mission and holed up there waiting for reinforcements to arrive. It was a place they could get their backs against the wall. They could basically defend it until help arrived. The safe room is a similar kind of concept and probably the, the cheapest, easiest way to get into a, a safe room is to put a, a, a decent door on, on your bedroom uh, with a decent lock on it. And let's say you take the fairly typical example of uh, a burglary in the middle of the night or a home invasion in the middle of the night. If you're asleep and you hear voices downstairs, breaking glass, something alerts you there's a problem, it's comparatively easy to get up, go over to the bedroom door, put a couple of bolts across the door, and you've basically got the concept of a safe room right there. People can't get in. You can't get out, but at least there's something solid between you and this potential aggressor. And then from there, you can get on your cell phone or the landline, call the cops, and basically just stay in the safe room until help arrives. That's the, the overall concept of the safe room. And, and hopefully the safe room has a communication with outside that is not able to be cut from inside. So you which actually happened, I believe, in that in that Jodie Foster movie. She was inside the panic room and the communications to outside had been cut off. So, and didn't her, her son had epilepsy or, or something or some kind of uh, illness involved as well that she or uh, needed insulin? Well, that's right, not diabetic. And uh, so it was. It was like a big. Um, she was stuck in there for a long time without any a, a means to communicate with the outside world. So that, that that's right, and you know, with with Hollywood being in the business that it's in, obviously they created a situation where it was she fixes one problem and then there's another problem. It's layer upon layer of problems to build drama. Uh, in real life, we really want to avoid doing that. We want to go in the other direction and make life as simple and uh, I, I won't even say as safe as possible because one of the things I put in the book is that we we want to be safe and we want to avoid disasters in our lives but at the same time we want to enjoy life I, I don't want to go and hide in a cave somewhere for the rest of my life in case something might happen to me I don't want to lock myself in a safe room for the rest of the life of, of my life because something bad might happen to me so now you have to you have to balance risk against achievement and have this balance in your life and that was another thing that, that I put in the book. But going back to the concept of the safe room, ideally have a, a cell phone in addition to your landline so that you've got at least one additional way of contacting the fire department, the police, or whoever you need while you're locked in your, in your fortified bedroom. 
Um, another thing you can do is uh, you've probably seen the little uh, chem lights or glow lights that you can get. It's a it's a glass tube inside a plastic tube, and you you bend it and mix two chemicals together, and it gives off this this glow, glow right. stick, as you like. Um, how how easy would it be to take a separate set of house keys for your front door, put one of those glow lights on them, just like a key fob, you know, a keychain, and in the event that you're stuck in your bedroom with the door locked and burglars walking around downstairs, you get on the phone to the police and you say, here's where I am, come and get me, and oh, by the way, when the police car shows out outside, I'm going to throw this glow stick out onto the front lawn with the door keys on it, and now you can let yourselves into the house, so you don't have to kick the door down. There are all these little things that you can do, but it just takes a little bit of planning ahead of time to be sure that you, you have a, a, a simple plan that's appropriate to a specific situation or a specific range of situations. Right, right, and I, I'm probably stating the obvious here, but there's there are probably people watching this or who will watch this uh, video, and they're going to say, "Well, my neighborhood's very safe. I don't have to worry about home invasions, and I don't have to worry about floods, or or I don't have to worry about the junkyard dog mentality." And what what advice do you have for them? What what do you think they should be thinking of instead of thinking everything is wonderful when they're safe? I'll give you a, an example of a true story uh, that, uh, that happened to a friend of mine a few years back. I, I have a buddy who grew up in the middle of Kansas on a farm, and you'd probably think that being stuck out in a rural area like that, there isn't really too much that can happen to you in the way of crime or terrorism or any of those man-made kind of events. But uh, what happened to, to him uh, was that his elderly mother was in the farmhouse one day alone and the rest of the family was out at work or whatever and this is the middle of Kansas there were a couple of felons who escaped from a county jail in Illinois they stole a car they murdered a homeowner somewhere in the outskirts of Chicago got a hold of a gun they took the car and the gun and they drove out west and as they're driving through Kansas, they see this farmhouse off in the distance, down a side road, off of the main road. They decided they'd drive down to the farmhouse and see what they could get. They got into the farmhouse. There was just an elderly woman there who they murdered in her own kitchen. They stole her car, and they headed to Colorado, where they were eventually apprehended. That elderly woman was the mother of a friend of mine. Wow. So you've got a situation where you, you think you're safe, but you can call it fate or whatever you want to call it, but it'll throw you a curve from time to time. And again, we go back to this idea of balancing quality of life and, and, and risk. And I certainly wouldn't say you shouldn't live in the middle of Kansas because you might get murdered. I mean, that, that would just be a ridiculous argument. But maybe you can say, okay, maybe I should just think about making sure that my doors are locked before I sit down and watch TV for the evening or before I climb into the shower, make sure the doors and windows are locked. Simple things like that just to secure your perimeter. Uh, if I happen to see someone coming up to my house who I don't recognize and I don't want to deal with, what's my plan for that? Do I have 911 on speed dial? What other tools are there at my disposal to deal with that kind of situation? And you know, Don, when you think about it, if you've ever had to, to plan something in detail, whether it's you know an extended vacation or a, a business plan or anything else, don't you kind of feel relieved when you've actually got that plan together and it's done and you can say, oh man, I'm glad I got that down and I don't have to worry about that anymore. It's there when I need it and I can go on to the next thing that I want to do. And that's really all I'm saying with, with the book. Have simple plans for simple, likely kinds of situations and then you don't have to be lying awake at night wondering what if. Very good point. And, and yes, you know, I, having a plan in, in business or in, in any part of your life always makes things less, you know, the, the, 
the anxiety level goes down very much. So uh, that's that's an excellent point. Um, as far as what we've got occurring in, uh, you know, with school shootings and terrorism and and, and various other things that um, you 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 could be vulnerable to out there. Uh, give me some examples of like how we might be able to protect ourselves from, uh, or or maybe not protect yourself, but just be a little bit more vigilant of of what's happening in your surroundings and be aware. Uh, what should we be looking out for as far as like you know when we're in the mall or when we're you know in a park or or you know even people you know sc in school. What what things should we be aware of? Uh, let, let's look at uh, you mentioned the mall, you know, shopping malls. Uh, let, let's look at that a little bit because sooner or later, whether whether we enjoy going to them or we get dragged there by our spouses, you know, we all end up in a shopping mall somewhere. Uh, shopping malls are kind of interesting because you uh, you have maybe two or three big double doors in that shopping mall where you know everybody walks into the mall the same way and if something happens like there's an active shooter or there's a fire or something like that people will tend to turn around and try and get out the way they came in um, for me when I walk into a place that I've never been before a shopping mall or a restaurant or any one of those big public places I'll try and look for an alternative way out. Um, let me digress to restaurants for a minute. I, I walk into a restaurant I've never been in before. I'm looking for the emergency exit. I'm looking for that big red or green fluorescent sign over the door that says exit. So now I've got two ways out. I've got the way I came in and if that doesn't work I've got the emergency exit. Well, why would I do that in a restaurant? Because there's two main things that happen in restaurants that would want you make you want to leave. A fight breaks out in the bar or a fire breaks out in the kitchen. Either way, I don't want to be there. I want to be back out in the parking lot, you know, at my car. Right. And with restaurants, there's one other exit that people tend to forget, and that's through the kitchen. They have to have an exit out back because they have to take the garbage out through the kitchen. They can't bring it out through the restaurant. So right. just about any restaurant has probably got three exits that you can you can get out if you have to. Going back to the mall, similar kind of thing. People always think about well, which which way did I come in? I've got to go out that way. And now you've got all of these people crushed into a couple of pairs of double doors, all trying to get out at the same time. In a lot of cases, these malls are set up where if you go into one of the stores inside the mall there's probably a back door out to the delivery area in that in that store because again they're not it's, it's the opposite of taking garbage out through the restaurant front door they don't bring all the all of the uh, the items that they're going to sell through the main door of the of the store in the mall. They've got a back door and the truck pulls up outside and loads it in from that way. That may be another way you can get out. In addition to all of those fire exits that, pe that they put in malls for people to be able to save their own lives. But you have to pay attention. You walk into a strange place regardless of where it is you should be looking around and say, okay, where is my alternate exit in case things go south here and I have to get out quickly? Second thing with malls, a lot of times we don't go there by ourselves. We go there with family members or friends. How much time does it take just as you walk in the mall to go, okay, well, look, if something happens, I'll meet you outside at you know, that restaurant across the street or at this intersection or, or whatever. Just have a plan so that you're not all standing around inside of a burning shopping mall going, where's Fred? You know, where's Julie? You know, how do I find them? Make right. sure that you've, you've got some place outside and away from that area that if there's a problem, you all go and meet there. And as, as we've always been told, especially when we were kids, that seconds count. Uh, especially in a fire. Uh, I remember all the fire drills we used to have when I was in school and you know even the air raid drills we used to have uh, it was sure. they were like you know just get out of the classroom and go to your pre-assigned spot and and just stand there and you know because seconds will kill you if you if you don't know what you're doing or where you have to go. 
So, yeah. You know what's interesting about that, though, Don? Because I, you, you know, I, I had a long corporate career, and y you know that uh, in most fairly large companies, they're they're obliged to have a fire drill at least once a year. Right. And uh, I remember one place I was working. I, I, it doesn't matter where it was, but it was it was a large corporation with a lot of large buildings in, in one campus. And uh, we typically would be told, you know, the morning of the fire drill or the day before the fire drill. Oh, tomorrow morning we're going to have a fire drill at nine o'clock. And we'd all be sitting there, and the fire alarm would go off at nine o'clock, and everybody would be conditioned to thinking, oh, this is a drill. So they get up and they walk outside and they all stand around with their hands in their pockets until we're told, okay, fire drill's over, you can all go back to work. I had a slightly different take on it. When that fire alarm went off, I would grab my, my bag, my briefcase, with all my stuff in it that I needed to get home, car keys, wallet, cell phone. And I'd grab that case and I'd make a habit of walking outside to the fire drill holding all of the stuff that I needed to get home at the end of the day. And people would look at me and one or two of them would say, what did you bring your bag for? Well, I brought it because it's a drill and, it, and you practice the drill the way that you would do things in the event of a real fire. In the event of a real fire, I'm grabbing my gear, I'm going to my car and I'm going home. I'm not going to stand around and watch the place burn down. Right. So right. there's an old saying that under stress, training takes over. So, you know, if, you, if you're going to have a fire drill, do it so that it's going to benefit you. Have a plan not just to get out of the building, but have a plan to get home. Um, you, you know what, uh, what it was like in New York on 9-11 after the attacks. Oh, yeah. There, there were people who... Uh, basically, a, a lot of people died because they weren't able to get out of those buildings fast enough. And once people had got out, maybe they had the means of getting home or communicating with other people. Maybe they didn't. But none of this is rocket science. It's just a question of having a little bit of planning, a little bit of foresight, and coming up with simple plans for specific situations that you think you may encounter, that it may be feasible that you get involved with. And another one, John, and, and two specific examples of this, too. Real eye-opener for me, movie theaters. Um, Susan lived in Aurora, and we used to go to that theater uh, that Holmes shot up. Yep. And after that happened... Even, not even just because of that theater, but just in theaters in general, I am always looking where the exits are, uh, how many people are sitting in which side, which would be the fastest way to get out if I had to get out quickly. And the other theater story, and, and was in my blog post about when Sue and I first got together, we were at the Mayan, and we were watching a film, and... In the film, there's an alarm on the spaceship that goes off, and then I'm hearing this other alarm going, and I started to smell smoke, and I grabbed her by the arm and said, we've got to get out of here. This, this theater's on fire. And as we were leaving, the firemen were coming in with the hose. Mm -hmm. uh, so it's like you always have to, you know, and, and sometimes because you're watching them, your senses are not totally attuned to what's going on around you, but it was just that I, I just thought I heard something different, and then when I got the whiff of smoke, I, I said, we got to get out of here now. So you, you just, and, and you know, theaters are one of those places where you've got a lot of people in a small area, and you've got to be able to get out quickly if you need to. Uh, yes, you do, and uh, w we go back to paying attention to our senses, see, hear, taste, smell, touch, and I always include that sixth sense that uh, I suppose you can call it intuition or, or whatever, but that little nagging voice in the back of your head that says, hey, you need to pay attention to that thing over there because it's going to come back and bite you if you don't. So th that sixth sense is, is I think, is is very much alive in most people, but we do have to pay attention to it. 
Um, the, the, the movie theater shooting, you know, sometimes the, there are no good answers or, or no good solutions to some problems. Uh, one thing that, uh, that I will say uh, about that kind of situation is that um, just about every state in the union now has some form of legislation allowing concealed carry of a firearm for law-abiding adults. And um, I think that's a good thing. Right. Uh, you know, without getting into the politics of, of, of the whole uh, the, the whole issue, if uh, if somebody's shooting at me and I can't get away, I at least want to have the ability to defend myself and, and the people around me that, that I care about. And I, I don't want to get us off track on on that issue, right. but that's that, that's certainly another another thing for a lot of people to consider. Take us through um, the other types of natural disasters where we might need to be prepared, and 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 if we had to put together, like you say, a bug out bag, what kind of things would we need to include for for when we leave? Well, that's a great question. I, I'm, I'm glad you brought that out because uh, there are times when the simplest solution to a problem is to just not be there. And um, the uh, just for people who may not be who are watching uh, this and may not be familiar with the term bug out bag, it's basically a, a bag that you pack with all of the things that you would need to survive for a few days away from home. Think of it as uh, you know going on vacation without all the fun part of it. So a bug out bag is something that um, uh, let, let's look an example of uh, some of the fires that we've had in Colorado the last few years and, and you know as well as I do that we've had some really bad fires that uh, have uh, not only burned a lot of homes up up in the mountains, but uh, some people have died over that as well. And if I'm living in an area that's prone to forest fires, and 10 o'clock in the morning there's a knock on my door and it's a county sheriff and he says, look, you've got five minutes to get out of here because we're going to have to close the road, we're going to have to close this area off and, and allow the fire department to come in. There's a major forest fire blowing in your direction. The wind's bringing it to your house. You have to leave now. So you're put in a situation where you basically have to get out within a few minutes. You don't have a lot of time to be thinking about where's my checkbook, where's my wallet, uh, where am I going to go? Do I have a, a change of clothes? Do I have uh, prescription medication that I need to, to stay alive? All of those things. I think it's a lot better if you can sit down before fire season in this particular example and start planning. Well, if I have to evacuate for a few days and we come back to the same thing, where am I going to go? Who am I going to take with me? What am I going to take with me? How are we going to get there? And what is the trigger that tells us it's time to leave? If you think of the sheriff's deputy coming to the door and saying, it's time to leave, there's your trigger. But you need to have all the rest of the stuff taken care of too. So the bug out bag is designed so you can just grab it out of a closet somewhere and take off at a dead run out of the house throw it in the back of your car and uh, and get away. It does require planning and it requires maintaining that bug out bag because probably you're going to have different items in it if you bug out in the middle of summer in 80 degree weather than you would if you bug out in the middle of winter with a foot of snow on the ground. So it's something you need to keep up as well. But typically uh, most people plan for a bug out of at least 72 hours, three days. So you're looking at a couple of changes of clothes, five days worth of prescription medication, maybe some cash, maybe a, a, an additional credit card or reloadable debit card so you can buy gas, all those kinds of things that, that you might need. And then you probably need a plan about where am I going to go. When you look at some of the um, the, the really large evacuations, that we've had uh, over the years where a lot of people have had to get up and leave at one time. 
do the hotels in the area support an extra pick a number, several hundred people descending on them saying, hey, I need a room for the next three months. And how far are you going to have to travel before you can actually find somewhere to stay? So these are all things that, uh, that I touch on in the book. I'm actually in the process of writing a bug out book as well to go along with dealing with danger. But there is a chapter that talks about how you behave outside of the home. And that includes some of the the basic rules and principles of bugging out. Now, as far as your personal experiences, you had the, the riot that got you to start thinking about this, but have you had any other experiences where um, things you know, were not quite right and you had to uh, make other plans based on what was going on around you or uh, any any Anything like that at all ever happen? Uh, um, no, nothing really major. I, I can remember a couple of times when uh, it, it wasn't so much me. When, when I was at work and I got a call from my wife saying the tornado, you know, she'd be at home and saying the tornado sirens are going off and you may not be able to get a hold of me for a while. I don't know if we're going to get a tornado or not, but I'm just telling you now I'm taking precautions. and. And for her, typically it was things like uh, uh, grabbing our two cats, getting them into a, a cat box, getting down in the crawl space where we already had uh, some water, some food, a couple of flashlights, spare batteries, all that stuff just, just stored in the crawl space. Um, you know, those kinds of things. So although I wasn't directly affected with those because I wasn't there, it was a plan that we'd put together between the two of us in the event that she was at home and I was somewhere else and you know what are you going to do so that that's probably the really the one that comes to mind is a couple of uh, close calls with tornadoes but um, you know a, a lot of these kinds of things for it, it sounds like it's an awful lot of stuff that you have to be thinking about the whole time and and people are saying well how on earth do I plan for all that and and how do I keep track of that? But I kind of think of this a, a little bit about the way that, that we drive. For, for everybody who's watching this, who's, who's ever driven a car or a motorcycle, you're heading down a busy road in your car. You're hopefully paying attention to what's going on around you. You are what I call in condition yellow. In other words, your radar is running. All of your senses are, are up and running. You're watching, is there a child who's going to run out in front of me? Is there a car that's going to cut me off? What is this car doing behind me who's now attempting to pass me? When is the next traffic light coming up where I know I'm going to have to stop? Your radar is running. And the whole time, you're changing speed, direction to compensate for what's going on around you. And I think we need to be a little bit like that when we're planning all of this stuff. If we're not aware of our surroundings and if we're not asking ourselves the, this really important question, what does this mean for me, then we're, we're not really on top of our game. And people will do that. If you've ever been called into a meeting, and I know I have at work, where they sit you down, they say, okay, we just want to tell you that we're going to have to lay off 5% of the workforce. The first thing that runs through everybody's mind is, what does this mean for me? Because it means one of two things. You're either going to be laid off or you're going to get 5% more work because you're going to have to pick up the slack from somebody who just got laid off. That's right. So that's the thought process. You can take that thought process and you can apply it to a lot of other situations. You're walking down the street in New York and you get this feeling, as you said at the beginning of the broadcast, there's a guy I think who seems to be following me. So the next thing is, well, what does this mean for me? Does he want to rob me? Does he want to come up and tell me that I've just won a million dollars in some contest, probably more the first than the latter. But your mind is already running and you're thinking, well, what does this mean? Does it mean I have to fight him? Does it mean I have to run away from him? Does it mean I have to try and talk him out of whatever he 
thinks he wants to do. You made a plan to get across the street and find a cab. You, right. you did that without, you had conscious thought about what you wanted to do, but you weren't thinking to yourself, I'm going to make a plan. You just went ahead and did it. And if we can condition ourselves to doing more things reflexively for specific situations, we can only do that if we plan those things ahead of time, which is why we come back to the idea of playing what I call the what-if game. What if the mole goes up in flames now? What if some guy in the movie theater walks in with a gun? Uh, what if the river overflows or what if the sheriff's deputy says I have to evacuate? They're simple broad concepts that we can think about and we can make simple plans to cope with them. Two, two points uh, that really play into a lot of the, the bug out mentality but on a larger scale because they got me to actually bug out from being in New York. The first one was, and this, I, tell, I tell you John, this really affected me. Um, about 21 years ago, a guy on a Long Island Railroad train, shot up the train, killed seven people. Mm -hmm. And when you're in a railroad car, you can't get out. I mean, you're you're stuck there inside. A, and and seriously, for months after that, I mean, it it was like a psychological thing with me that I was I was afraid in my commute because of that. The other thing was um, the uh, Iraq War, the first Gulf War. And I, I wrote about this in my blog piece about your book. When I was riding the train, there was all of this talk that the Iraqis were going to put some kind of poison gas into the uh, tunnels under the East River, so that the Long Island Railroad and and all all the trains would you know we would all be poisoned. And a lot of people were going on not well, not online, but they were ordering Israeli gas masks. And keeping them in their on their person with them just in case, and of course, you know me, you know, being the guy who works in publishing, we don't get paid a lot. And the gas masks were like 150 bucks, and I was like, well, you know, I guess I'm just gonna breathe deeply when it when it happens. But it was one of those things where it was an enlightened moment where I where I put those two together, and and I was not actually in New York for 9/11. I was in New York for the, the 93 bombing, and I saw what happened and how the city was locked down. And that was another thing that got me to say, I, I, I got to not be here. I got to not work here in this city anymore. Um, as much as I really enjoyed what New York had to offer as far as uh, social and, and recreation, it, it was just too much stress of all of these things that could possibly happen to you. And... You know, being out in Colorado now, it's a, it's a much different feel. But now, like you said, you've got natural disasters, we've got the fires, we've got floods, and again, here's here's I when I first moved out here, it's like you have to be aware of you're in your car and you take a ride maybe up into the foothills, and pretty much everything can kill you. Uh, if you're in the winter time and you don't have a, a blanket in your car and your car breaks down, if you take off on a hike. And you come across a rattler and it bites you. If you know the, you're walking and the bear and the mountain lion is there, I mean, it's a whole different mentality now of of danger of what you have to be prepared for than you know back in the big city. But you still have to be prepared, and that's I think that's what we're getting at is like always have a plan and always try to be prepared. Uh, yeah, and, and there's, there's definitely a balance in, in, in your life there. You, you know, I've, I think I mentioned before that uh, I don't think any of us want to just go and hide in the basement for the rest of our lives in case something bad might happen to us. So I think we, we have to balance risk against achievement. We, we want to go out and we want to do good things, whether it's hiking in the woods or, or skiing or whatever it is. Uh, even just driving down the down the street is um, is a balance of risk against achievement. You risk getting into a car accident, but you achieve so much more if you can get from A to B in your car. You know, so I I, I completely agree with you. Uh, you know that um, we want to go out and do 
do the good things, but we want to avoid some of the things that uh, we consider to be too much of a risk. You decided that for you at that point in your life, living in New York was not an acceptable risk for you, so you did something about it. You went somewhere else. Right. Which to me is, is a perfectly acceptable solution. Um, you, you know, and I'm not saying everybody should leave New York. I'm saying for you as an individual, at that point in your life, it was the right thing for you to do. You were comfortable with that. Do you have any parting words for us on what we should look out for or how we can uh, get a copy of your book? And, and by the way, uh, let me, you can put it up too and show, show your book. See how's, how's that? Can you see that? Dealing okay. with the danger. Be prepared, aware, and decisive. Yeah, you can you can find it uh, on Amazon. You can find it at Barnes and Noble. It's available uh, to download as um, as a um, an iTunes uh, you know uh, ebook. And uh, you can also if you go to my my website. Uh, uh, www.junkyard-dog.net there's uh, a lot of what I think is pretty good information there plus the means to buy the book if uh, if you'd like to do that. What is your um, follow-up on, on the uh, bug out going to be called? Um, I, it, well actually it's kind of funny it's, it's a long story and I, I won't bore you with all the details but I, I actually uh, wrote a sort of a mini version of that book for a publisher a few years back and uh, before they came up with a title they just started calling it the bug out book and okay. um, I thought you know that actually makes sense so I, as I'm going through and getting this thing together I think that's probably what it's going to be called it's just the bug out book but uh, I, I kind of slowed down a little bit I, I haven't been getting through it as quickly as I'd like and there's still a fair bit of I keep finding stuff that needs to go in there you know and at some point you have to cut it off and say enough right but um, the idea basically is just give people a much better idea of planning to bug out and looking at some of the options they have not just uh, the classic uh, the end of the world is coming kind of thing you know but just simple things how do you get out of supermarkets and, and shopping malls, you know, the way we talked about earlier, those kinds of things. Because for most people, it's it's going to be the day-to-day the -day simple things that are going to kill you. It's not going to be a, you know, a meteorite or a, a tsunami, you know. So we have to concentrate on where we are and what we're doing at this time and what are the likely things that could come up to bite us. And that, that I think, is one of the most important messages to get across. And, and that, that was a good point because when the zombie apocalypse comes, <laughs> you're going to want to stay in the supermarket. <laughs> well, that's right. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, stay, stay where the food is. <laughs> Here's, now, have you seen this clip? Um, it's a, it's a, an overview shot from an elevator. Okay, a girl gets in. She's like eight or nine years old. She's standing on one side. Okay. It, goes down like a floor, a guy gets in, the doors close, and then all of a sudden he starts grabbing her. Okay? But mm -hmm. she's, she's like a black belt in martial arts, and so the little girl, like, just pummels this guy. <laughs> and, and actually, the, I mean, she, he, the doors open, and he tries to get out and get away from her, and she grabs him back in as the doors close and pummels him some more. <laughs> it's, it's an amazing video. I mean, I, I not that you know he he started it. He was trying something. So she, if you have martial arts skills and people don't know it, it's like you've got that extra little, you know, something special that you know nobody's going to be able to tangle with. I, uh, I I always say to people, uh, you know, keep in mind three words, well, four really, but prepared, aware, and decisive. Have a plan, be aware of your surroundings, and know which plan 
you're going to execute and when you're going to execute it. But, you know, it's kind of funny, Don. I, I hadn't seen that piece of film, but when you think about it, who was actually the less prepared out of the two of those people, the little girl or the guy, you know, the creep who was going to try and assault her? He, he, he locked himself in a steel box with somebody who could basically beat the crap out of him. Uh, so, so although I'm although I'm glad it happened to him, I guess he hadn't read my book. <laughs> <laughs> well, we've we've pretty much uh, come to the end now, and uh, I would like to thank jo my guest John Higgs for being on Pub Talk today. Uh, it was a great hour, and I'm sure we covered a lot of ground and. And hopefully we'll get the chance to talk to John again when he's got the new Bug Out book out. And um, again, thank you, John, for, for being my guest today. And uh, anyone who missed this um, Google Hangout, this was a good one, and it will be available for replay. So until the next time, this is Don Schmidt, the book Kahuna. Bye-bye. Thank you, Don. Thanks, John. <laughs>